This is Democracy Now!, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman, as we turn to North Carolina, which saw a record voter turnout this year, including by its nearly one and a half million African American voters. Among them, Ronnie Long, which doesn't make him unusual, except that he had just come out of prison after spending 44 years behind bars for a crime he did not commit. He walked out of the Albemarle Correctional Institute a free man on August 27th. I'm disappointed, really, in a system that's supposed to be, you understand, saying about right and wrong. I'm disappointed that you have people, you understand, saying that's in positions that don't want to do the right thing, but they'll do things, you understand, saying to try to uh, mislead you. You live, in, you live and die by what you do. You reap what you sow. You see what I'm saying? So I always believe that, you understand, know saying that no matter how difficult this thing has become, one day I will be standing where I'm standing right now. And I ain't never gave up that hope. That was Ronnie Long speaking just after his release from prison earlier this year in August. His ordeal began in 1976, when he was convicted by an all white jury of raping a 54 year old woman named Sarah Boast, who was a wealthy white widow. In 2015, his lawyers learned investigators had withheld exculpatory evidence proving his, his innocence, including semen samples and fingerprints taken from the crime scene that did not match his own. The evidence was either withheld from his attorneys or disappeared while in government hands while witnesses for the state committed perjury at his trial. It would take several more years and a ruling by the Fourth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for Long to win his freedom. At a virtual hearing in May, Judge James Wynn asked, quote, what is it about us that we want to prosecute and keep people in jail when we know evidence might exist that might lead to a different outcome? Why is that so offensive to us now that we want to protect illegal activity from 44 years ago? When did justice leave the process such that we let our rules blind us to the realities that we all can see, the judge wrote? Ronnie Long's mother, Elizabeth, passed away just weeks before his release, which also came on the birthday of his wife, Ashley. She had not seen her husband since March, when Albemarle Prison was closed to visitors due to COVID-19. Ronnie Long was 20 years old when he was wrongfully convicted. He's now 65 and has finally been exonerated. He joins us now from Durham, North Carolina. Ronnie, welcome back to Welcome to Democracy Now! for the first time. How does it feel to be free? I mean, uh, when you're talking about coming out of restraints and being restrained and being able to get up and do what you want to do without somebody telling you what to do, um, experiencing life. Right now, as it is, because you know, I wasn't introduced to this world here. This world here is a little bit too fast for me. But I mean, you got people, you understand, saying they're trying to adapt. I mean, this is great for I mean, it's a blessing within itself. I'm talking about miraculous blessing within itself for me to even be sitting here right now. And what was it like to vote for the first time, Ronnie Long? Well, you got a lot of blacks. You I mean you got a lot of blacks right now today? You understand? Saying they don't even believe in that vote thing, because number one, they feel as though you understand? Saying uh, they're gonna put who they believe when they say they. They talking about, I uh, say, uh, the capitalists, the capitalists. They gonna put who they want in there anyway. But. Uh, this year here was the first time I ever voted against this, and I ain't never been uh, that one, one that was tied up in a situation like that. I really put any emphasis on it. But as I become older, you understand, know like I said, I was locked up when I was 20 years old. So as I got older, when I got out, I felt as though, you understand, know saying this system is in a serious need of reform. So I, I, I urge younger blacks, older black people of color, all people to exercise that right that you have, you understand, so even though you may think your vote don't make a difference, 
somewhere down the line, you understand, said it might be the vote to make a difference. Last month, the North Carolina governor, Roy Cooper, said for the first time he would consider the petition signed by more than 50,000 people calling for your pardon as well as three others. This is what he said. That uh, petition uh, from uh, Mr. Long, which I think was received a week or so ago, will receive careful consideration by me and by my office. Uh, it is a, a significant uh, power of the governor to be able to make decisions uh, about what a judge and jury have done. And, and I take that uh, power under the Constitution very seriously, but uh, we'll review that application along with others. That was North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper. I want to read more from the concurring opinion by Judge James Wynn of the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, which ruled to send your case back, Ronnie Long, to the federal courts in North Carolina. Wynn is an African-American Obama appointee who also grew up in a small North Carolina town. The judge wrote, quote, Officers hid evidence, despite knowing that doing so could lead directly to Mr. Long's death. Such an action is repugnant in any context, but it takes on a particularly sinister meaning here, given our country's historical treatment of black men accused of raping white women. Ronnie Long, what are you demanding of Governor Cooper right now? I mean, we're going to look at this thing realistically, right? My legal documents speak for themselves. The constitutional violations in this case speak for itself. I mean, you got people that have been victimized by the system, like myself, and then you turn around and you put me back into a society and expect from me to live a productive life. I'm saying to Roy Cooper, if there's any kind of compassion in your heart, man, you understand saying you talk about you a religious person. You talk about, you understand saying how you got to do the right thing. Right now, I'm struggling. I struggled 44 years to come from behind them fences, but come out here in the street and continue to struggle. What is it that I'm asking Roy Cooper for that he can only, I mean, he ain't got to do nothing but sign his name and pardon me and three other brothers, you understand, know saying who have been victimized by a corrupt judicial system here in the state of North Carolina? Many people ain't crazy. People that, I mean, when I say these people, I'm talking about these people that's in these authoritarian positions just then said that they don't want to do their job. Boy Cooper need to pardon me and the mother brother so we can get on with our life or what little life we might have left. So, Ronnie Long, if he were to grant you a pardon, that would allow you to receive a maximum of $750,000 in compensation for being unjustly imprisoned, $750,000. I just took out a calculator. So that is $17,000 a year for the 44 years you were wrongly imprisoned. You haven't even gotten that. Are you suing the state? I mean, this is something that's being litigated right now, right? It's a subject that's being litigated right now. Like I say, uh, I got a, I got a defense team. I got a team, you know what I'm saying, that's more or less going to go to work on this. Because, I mean, I mean, let's be realistic about this whole thing. Now, you, this is why I put all my legal documents online. You ain't got to believe what I say. You ain't got to accept what I say. I tell you to go to run alone, free run alone dot org. I, I mean, that, this is this is where I put my documents online because I want people to be able to go to my web address 
and look at my documents and see what the state of North Carolina, you understand, is doing and they're done to me. And not only me, it didn't stop with me. They're still doing it. I'm going to show you something. In my case, the chief of police went to the county commissioner's office, got the master lists of all prospective jurors that I was able to pick me a panel from and started deleting names off the master list. He put, he put in that pool, that jury pool that I picked my panel from, he picked who he wanted to go in there. But I didn't find out about this 30 years later. My thing is this, you I mean, if anybody, like Ron Cooper has some kind of compassion in his heart, you understand, saying to be able to see through things and do what's right for the people. I need that I need that part in order to try to get on with my life. Ronnie Long, talk about those last months in prison. You were there during the COVID-19 lockdown, um, the dangers for you in prison. I mean, you're in your 44th year you were in prison, um, packed into this prison uh, with others, the outbreak of COVID-19. What was it like inside? Well, oh, lack of. Like a can of sardines. You got people, you understand, saying this laying around on top of each other. Pretty soon, I mean, you know, uh, uh, sure indeed, they come in, they take your temperature, they'll give you a mask and tell you to wear that. But the social distancing is not there. It's not there. They cannot distance the prisoners from each other without reducing the prison population. Ronnie, North Carolina? Yes. Yes. Your mom died in the last weeks that you were in prison. First of all, our condolences on the loss of your mother. What did that mean to you weeks before you got out? My mom and my dad have always supported me. When, when I knew all before all white jury in front of a white jury for sexually assaulting a white woman, me and my family knew that I was on my way to the penitentiary. How are you going to send a tainted jury pool down there for me to pick a pound from? I ended up with 12 whites in there for sexually assaulting a pillar, a wealthy white female in front of a white dude, white DA, and 12 white jurors. Me and my family knew that I was on my way to the penitentiary. The only thing we can do is try to outlast this storm that I was going through. I used to talk to my mother every day on the phone, you understand? So I talked to her every day on the phone because after I lost my father, all more or less like trying to feel that empty void that was in my mother's life because they had been together for over 50-something years. My mom used to always tell me she was going to be there when I get out. I'm going to be right here when you get out. Those 15, 20 minutes that those lying-ass Concord Police Department came down to my house and told my mama we're going to take me no more than 15 to 20 minutes that I would be back within that time. That I didn't need anybody to want me. Those 15, 20 minutes turned into 44 years. You also married when you were in prison, Ronnie. You married your wife, Ashley. We just showed images of her greeting you as you came out of prison after 44 years. Yeah, that was her. That was <laughs> Hey, look, hey, look, I'm like, I'm sitting in the cell block 
watching TV. The officer come in and tell me to pack my stuff. Now I'm looking at him like, pack my stuff? Pack my stuff for what? Man told me to pack my stuff and go to receiver. When I get to receiver, I got a suit of clothes laying right there. And then people telling me I'm going on. Man, I'm going to pass out. For eight years, the very first eight years of this 44, I didn't never see anything but the sky. Out behind a wall so tall, you understand, says the way you didn't see nothing else but the sky. For eight years, I lived like that. But I never lost focus on what my mission was. Ronnie Long, I want to thank you so much for being with us. Um, Ronnie Long spent 44 years in a North Carolina prison for a crime he did not commit, released in August after a federal appeals court vacated his conviction, and the state finally dropped the case. He voted for the first time this year. His website is freeronnielong.org.